unconventional conventionists. Thanks for tuning in to Time Warp Radio, the Rocky Horror Picture Show movie by minute podcast, where with each seven minutes, bum, 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 we can make you a fair, hey, hey, man, man. <laughs> I'm Haley Mervini. And I'm Katie Tomney. And we are your resident criminologists on all things Rocky Horror. Today's episode, we'll be covering the timestamps 2112, which left us right in the middle of Time Warp, uh, and we'll be covering today everyone's favorite part of the movie, I would say. Oh, yes. The moment we've all been waiting for, and by we've all, I mean (laughs) definitely me. (laughs) I've been waiting for this. We're going to talk about Sweet Transvestite. Yes. And the man who made Frankenfurter everyone's sexual preference. Yes. Tim Curry. We're going to talk about his career, his opinion on the movie, how it's kind of evolved over time. Our segment will finish up at the timestamp 2750, which neatly wraps up with the elevator sealing the frame and uh, Frankenfurter ascending into his laboratory. We're also going to get into Columbia's verse, yes. what we think about that. So, uh, if we were in a shadow cast at this point in the movie, mm-hmm. we would have Transylvanians yes. lining the back of the stage, lining the aisles, if yes. we have enough. Crossing our fingers that we have enough. (laughs) Getting people to stand up to join in because literally the instructions are... On screen and being (laughs) sung to you. (laughs) Like, it's... You pick it up by the end of it. Yes. Like... Even if you've never heard this song before, mm -hmm. if you are surrounded by 150 other people that are doing it and you're being screamed (laughs) the instructions into your face, you'll pick it up. Yes. We would have Brad Janet, Riff and Magenta, you know, mimicking the framing of Magenta how, as she's about to step onto the banquet table full of food. Um, and we'd also have Columbia preset on her the, jukebox or, you know, fill in the blank, whatever is uh, available for her. <sighs> yeah, I think as Janet, like, she's confused and she's a little bit more aware of what is actually happening yeah the strangeness yeah that they're observing and that as she says later like it's not the junior chamber of commerce this isn't (laughs) this is by no means normal festivities that were well and i've said it before and i'll say it again brad is a giant doof and he's just (laughs) excited he's like Hey, I was just looking for a phone, but, like, now we're at a party. (laughs) He is just the biggest doofus, and, like, that's just, the more we get into it, the more it's apparent that he just has no idea what's going on, but he's excited about it. Blinded (laughs) by it. He stops listening to Janet at a point. But, uh, we left off with Magenta saying that with voyeuristic intention, she sees all. And Riff continues with a bit of a mind flip. You're into the time slip. Nothing will ever be the same. I like that he's suggesting that the Transylvanian's way of life is not so far off from human civilization. Like, just with a bit of a change of perspective. (laughs) Like, a bit of a mind flip. (laughs) (laughs) Like, yeah, it's a flip. Like, people attending Rocky Horror or watching the movie at home will have, I don't know, any number of their norms questioned. Yes. Sometimes without even watching the movie. Right. And, like, if if you just show up to a live shadow cast of it with the barest knowledge of this movie... All of a sudden, you're seeing people Mm half-dressed. You see all kinds of different people. Like, literally, people in lingerie, people just in 
you know, gold booty shorts. You see people dressed as Transylvanians. Yeah, people just of all shapes and sizes, people of all um, gender expressions. It's you. You get such a rainbow of, mm-hmm. of human life and yeah, yeah it's it's just it's awesome the cult the culture that's been created around rocky horror really mirrors the movie itself very well and and i i appreciate that so much yes because riff and magenta are inviting brad and janet in for ulterior motives ultimately mm-hmm. like like they're they're gonna use them as as bait but also they're making a commentary on their lifestyle like you guys might think that this is extreme and you might think that what you're seeing is very extreme but like is it really not really and if you think about how many people go to a shadow cast one time Mm -hmm. come up at the end of the show and are like how do i go how do i join cast how do i do this i want to be a part of this this is my first time ever seeing it and i'm in love right because it happens all the time all the time and even if it inspires someone to come back a second time if it inspires someone to bring a friend the next time they go like they say nothing will ever be the same you good bad or ugly remember Rocky Horror yep. and people who haven't seen it in years like you can name it's a household culture piece mm-hmm. that you name it and people will either say oh yeah I remember when I was in college and I went and saw it one time mm-hmm. or they're like oh you're into that movie <laughs> <laughs> it created a huge a huge community a huge sense of inclusion. Anyone's invited. Yep. Even Brad and Janet. Even the squares. Magenta steps onto the banister. She gropes the banister and a taxidermy bird. Yeah, they're just everywhere, those taxidermy birds. There are birds all over this film. All over. All over the place. And, and we, we figured out kind of our, our theory, our running theory on why there are so many birds. <laughs> See, my theory, personally, is it's an homage to Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, like Psycho. Like like it, the birds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there are birds everywhere, and there are eyes everywhere, and they're, they're constantly watching you, and there's just this kind of ominous level of an, another presence Of being watched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's definitely that scene when Norman Bates is talking to Janet Lee. He is a predator. Like, we're supposed to, as an audience, get the sense that he, if he hunts all of these birds and he stuffs them as trophies, Mm -hmm. he's going to be watching her later. Yep. And it serves the same purpose here where Riff and Magenta are going to camera in mm-hmm. and Big Brother, Brad and Janet, a little later in the movie. Um, but I also like the idea that they don't know what to do with all of their birds. Like, if they... <laughs> okay, no, I think you came up with this, that that there aren't birds on... Transylvania. Transylvania. <laughs> so... So this is their first experience with birds, <laughs> and they're so enamored with this creature that they have to keep every one of them. Yeah, they just have to keep collecting them and, and showcase <laughs> them like fine art. And the bird is on the same table as all of the food mm-hmm. that the other Transylvanians have brought for this like potluck they're having. Yeah. Riff <laughs> Hands Brad like a donut, maybe, or a bagel. A bagel? A yeah. donut? It's some type of pastry. Brown pastry. pastry. I think that's him trying to be a good host. <laughs> like, have some food, you do guys. You, do you guys want any of our spread? It's uh, quite, quite cultured, as you can see, because we have flags stuck on everything. <laughs> Magenta, as she's stepping onto the table, she says, 
You're spaced out on sensation. Like you're under sedation. And Let's do the time warp again. Let's, Let's do, do the, the time, time warp, warp again. again. Magenta's step forward is the same... Ha! Huh. Yeah, that she does at the end of Floor Show when mm-hmm. they're, they've... Uh, uh, spoiler alert, when they've mutinied. And I think that confirms that this is Riff and Magenta... Hatching laying, their plan. Yes. They're laying out the footwork. I want to talk about this table. This buffet oh, table. God. So it is covered in all of these foods everywhere. And they all have like random flags stuck in them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But none of the flags seem to match the type of food that's being offered. So in this shot, as she's stepping onto the table, what we see is in the lower left corner, there's like a, it almost looks like a princess cake, like a mm-hmm. blue princess cake with a yellow jello <laughs> stuck on top of it it's like tiered with whipped cream frosting layering it yeah but it look i mean like clearly it's made out of styrofoam it has the switzerland flag sticking out of this princess cake which i'm sorry but i didn't know that switzerland had anything to do with either jello or <laughs> princess cakes like it's not a a touchstone like none of these items on the table are the delicacy you would think of yeah. as a like like if you went to the food and wine festival yeah. at Disneyland like you would think like Swiss chocolate right something yeah it's weird it and makes then on no the sense. other side of the table <laughs> there's this tower of of pastry it looks like someone started to make a croque and bouche. <laughs> And then ran out of and then, puff pastry. Yeah, ran out of puff pastry about a third of the way up the tower. <laughs> and then it's just like this pointy chocolate cake, maybe? Yeah, with various cookies. It looks like Star of David cookies that are mm-hmm. like just pasted onto this chocolate cake that's cone shaped. And it then it has... makes it look like the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, almost. and then it has like a German flag in it. It's and it's <laughs> piercing. There's like a bleeding heart at yeah. the top of it. So it's like... None of them really make sense. make sense. They don't go together with the food. So it seems like... Oh my gosh. And there's a loaf of bread. Just a slice of yeah, loaf, loaf of bread. <laughs> so what it seems like to me is these Transylvanians are trying to showcase the culture that they're studying. Mm-hmm. But they haven't really been studying at all that well. They're not that good at it. They're not <laughs> at... It's interesting to me because I think Transylvanians make a lot of assumptions mm-hmm. about the human species. And we are getting a lot of evidence how out of touch with it they really are. Yes. So, like, if ultimately this is, like you know, a, a driver's ed course for <laughs> Transylvanian kids to not visit Earth or whatever. If a Transylvanian is ascribing human life to being meaningless, does it matter if they're not observing us that well? You know? <laughs> yeah, like, seriously. What good is their opinion? If, if they're not even gonna do, like, a real German delicacy. Well, okay, I could also be totally wrong. That cake could be like old school, old family recipe German specialty cake. It could be. <laughs> it totally could be. But it doesn't make sense. All of the items. In the context. Right. Yeah. And then there is a bottle, there's multiple bottles of champagne, which we'll see Riff drinking from later Mm -hmm. when magenta steps forward onto the table janet faints again again (laughs) for a second time (laughs) we kind of got into the different trope reasons why women faint in movies Mm -hmm. i think this one is magenta's gorgeous legs are like right there next to brad's eyes and she grabs at him like she can feel the faint coming on. Yeah, she's like, oh, Brad, Brad, oh, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna no. faint, I'm gonna faint. And she does, again, like a back bend, the most dramatic faint ever. <laughs> and 
it works because Brad starts fanning her. He's he wants her to wake up and and resuscitate, but doesn't matter to Riffin Magenta because they nope. start um, arm dancing toward Columbia, and I love this moment because in the commentary of uh, oh, it's so cute with Richard and Patricia. They, you can tell, get so... Sentimental. Right. And wistful in that moment. Um, and then they're just obviously so enamored with Nell. They just, honestly, at this moment, they just stop talking altogether. And you can tell they're just watching the movie and reminiscing. And it is the they're cutest there. thing. It's they're the cutest thing. Time warping. They're back in that moment. They're thinking about <laughs> how, that choreographing that together and the other reason I think Janet might faint is similar to Riff's monologue in Frankenstein Place. Mm -hmm. It's not the same English that's being used in Damn It Janet. Yeah. Like it's not the it's not a dialect that they're used they to. understand. They're using more complex terms uh -huh. as opposed to I'm mad about you. Yeah, it's a very formal English that the Transylvanians have learned. Mm -hmm. And it's really disorienting because we're getting all of this detail and it's being sung at us. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a theater, like people are yelling over it, <laughs> so it's impossible to. <laughs> so she's just kind of feeling overwhelmed, is your theory? Yeah, like it's. It's overwhelming sitting in the audience. Yeah, but is it overwhelming enough for you to faint dramatically? I think the look on some people's faces <laughs> sometimes is of, like, genuine, I didn't realize it was this kind of event. I wasn't prepared for all of this. <laughs> like, I thought it was going to be a midnight movie. Like, I thought we were going to be up late, and, like, maybe people will be talking because, like, that's what people do in late movies now. But when people start standing up and dancing, you do feel a little bit like you're in a cult. We have Frank and Pastor, you know, leading the ceremonies. I think the reaction people have sometimes to time warp <laughs> is justified. <laughs> yep. Uh, we got a really interesting DM this week mm -hmm. about how for a lot of people, Rocky Horror has become to some level their church mm -hmm. because queer people are sometimes purposefully excluded from places of worship and yes. places of community. And like, you know, like how, how bad is it really? Like if, if, if this is what a cult is... It's a pretty mild cult. Yeah. <laughs> like, like no one has yet informed us to all drink cyanide at the same time. <laughs> and we should be very aware of that. <laughs> and I think we'd all be skeptical enough to be like, yeah, you can eat shit. <laughs> but literally... By the end of Time Warp, everyone is participating. Mm -hmm. It's like... You're either participating or you've left. During the Chaos pre-show, we always say, if this isn't something you're into, get the fuck out, bitch. And people are like, oh, ha, ha, ha. And then by the end of Time Warp, you really know if you want to leave or not. Mm -hmm. In uh, the Shadowcast, we would have Ruth and Magenta dancing over to Columbia, mm -hmm. who is sitting on a Rockola jukebox. Yep. It's high so fidelity. Pretty. It is so pretty. It's got those cute gold stars mm -hmm. on the side and the front. And Sins of the Flesh has the prettiest jukebox. The prettiest jukebox. Those are a rarity yes. at a shadow cast. I mean, I think people like are very creative mm -hmm. and you could very easily figure out some kind of like glass concoction. May I, I recommend plexiglass or something non-shattery? Yeah, so <laughs> someone can sit on it, right? It's sturdy. It's hard because it's only there that one time, but like... It's so pretty and it's so memorable. Well, you have your story with your partner 
involving the jukebox, the yeah. Sense of the Flesh jukebox. So the very first time that my partner came to see me at uh, Rocky Horror doing the shadow cast, I was playing Columbia, and she always talks about how in this scene, in this moment, when she saw me sitting on top of the jukebox, she was like, that's it. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in the world. <laughs> Isn't that, you know? <laughs> I just think about how, uh, like, a prop can bring something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's crazy. It just elevates it. And it's crazy that that was the show she saw, that you, ha that you had that jukebox. The jukebox. And... Uh, yeah, but otherwise a hard prop to maintain because yes. you just have it for time warp and, and then... it's heavy yeah. and it takes up so much space. But Columbia's on this jukebox. Mm -hmm. Riff and Magenta are doing more elbow dancing. I just, I think that the elbow sex is such an iconic moment and like for the two of them as a character, but like it's ha like we're getting variations of it throughout. Throughout, yeah. Yeah. So they walk over and they frame her, like almost one on either side. But behind her, we get the look at the other side of the ballroom. Of the ballroom. <laughs> it's like palm trees uh -huh. wrapped in Christmas lights. With garden gnomes. Yes. And artificial flowers at like the base of them. More taxidermy birds in the back. And just, like, every light is on in the house. <laughs> no wonder Brad and Janet could see it from the road, because... Every freaking light is on. <laughs> like, literally, so many lights are... Like, there's a sconce there, a sconce there, a <laughs> chandelier there. Like, there's so much electricity being used that makes me think that they are harnessing the electrical storm that's happening outside that's what's possibly powering the convention right we have a couple more transylvanians dance in front of our trio and columbia gives us her best way of participating in the time warp in the time warp as a non-Transylvanian, like a fellow human person. Well, I was walking down the street just having a think when a snake of a guy gave me an evil wink. Well, it shook me up. It took me by surprise. He had a pickup truck and the devil's eyes. Okay, so pickup truck makes me think delivery driver. Mm -hmm. Makes me think this is about Eddie. Mm -hmm. He just met her on the side of the road. <laughs> like, she was just having her ordinary, regular old life. I think it was more like, he stopped at a stoplight, Columbia saw him, was like, oh, that's my man, mm -hmm. and then her world just changed. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happens, as literally the story you just told me with Jay, like, all it takes is that moment, is that one look, you know I'm attracted to somebody, um, and then nothing will ever be the same, and she wasn't expecting to meet Eddie. Nope. She was just having her humdrum life. And a snake of a guy gave her an evil wink. And he's got the devil's eyes, so is she just saying that, like, he didn't have the greatest of intentions, or was he drugged out? Well, what I'm thinking is we see Eddie a little bit later, not quite yet, but he's kind of this rock and roll, rockabilly, pompadour, mm -hmm. tattooed, leather vest wearing guy. Motorcycle bro. So like, he's a snake of a guy, he has the devil's eyes, is she just implying that like, oh, he was this rock and temptation. roll guy this temptation and he was so out of what i was used to mm -hmm. is that kind of what we're talking about here where it's like he's not necessarily a bad dude he's just way out of what her norm was because columbia is described as a groupie that's mm -hmm. literally her title she is a groupie mm -hmm. so maybe she saw eddie she fell in love with him and became a groupie to the rock and roll lifestyle okay and I mean, that explains why stylistically the song changes a little bit. It becomes a little bit more 
Rock rockabilly. Billy. Yeah, it, it becomes more like hot patootie. More reminiscent to the original version of Time Warp. Oh my gosh. Which, which is more doo more rockabilly, more um, dancey. I feel yeah. like it feels more retro. We'll post a video on Blogspot. Mm-hmm. Uh, they definitely changed elements of the original song for the film adaptation. When you listen to Richard O'Brien play guitar versions mm-hmm. of any of these songs, it's totally his style. Like, he's totally a rockabilly dude yep. that plays everything with that yeah it's it's interesting that columbia um doesn't really know how to participate in this and that it shifts the style of the song she's now giving us background on why she's there she ends it out with he stared at me and i felt a change time meant nothing never would again which Again, it it shows me that she is trying to relate to the Transylvanians in any way that she can. They're all singing about, oh, time warp, time warp. Mm-hmm. My life is different because time warp. And she's like, wait, my life changed too. This is my story. This is my version of a time warp is like getting wrapped up in my relationship, in love. And, and that's why I think that the pacing and the style of music changes is because her story is different from everybody else's. She doesn't have that shared background with them. Mm -hmm. As us, as audience members, this sounds more like Dama Janet. This sounds more conversational. So I think us too, if we were watching it for the first time, we should get tipped off that she is more like Brad and Janet than she is like Riff and Magenta. Yes. The line of guests that have gathered to watch her tap dance line up along the... Red carpet. Red carpet. Yeah. And they say, let's do the time warp again. Let's do the time warp again. And Brad looks uh, amused. (laughs) He's kind of like... He's intrigued. Oh, okay. They're going to do another round of this. Okay. Interesting. (laughs) They're doing... They do this a lot. And Janet doesn't know where to look. Mm -mm. Poor Brad and Janet. If they wanted to participate and learn the steps of the dance, here's another opportunity, guys. We're about to get the instructions again. Now you know it's not just Transylvanians here. Now Columbia's here, too. She's doing it. Yeah, and at least they're, like, semi-friendly to humans, if there's that one there. Like, (laughs) okay, Let's try it. Let's try try to do it. Because you see Brad later. Tapping his foot. Snapping along. <laughs> He's kind of getting into it. <laughs> but I love this shot because um, this is where, this is another place where you get such a good view of all of the Transylvanians and their, their interesting costumes. Yes. Because they are wearing these tailcoats and they all have different colored shirts or lapels or hats or... You know, they all have these splashes of character to them. Mm-hmm. S- splashes of vibrant colors. They all are wearing sunglasses. Mm-hmm. They all are wearing a party hat of some variety. Mm-hmm. And they all have those white socks and... Black shoes. Yeah, black shoes. Some of them have, like, open-toed shoes. Some of them are wearing sandals. So it's... You could very easily replicate a Transylvanian costume with items of clothing you already have. Yep. And And that's honestly what I did. I had a pair of black leggings, a pair of white socks, a pair of black wedges, and Mm -hmm. a button-up shirt. And then I went out to a thrift store and found a tailcoat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I happened to be in New York visiting family, and... I was walking down the street. I literally walked into a tux rental shop Mm -hmm. that was there. And I looked in the boys section. And there it was. And there was one that was just like the right size and had tails. And I was like, excellent. This is what I needed. And it was like 12 bucks, 15 bucks. Yeah. And you can always, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to find at like Goodwill's. 
I'd say. But it is possible because I did find one um, maybe two years ago mm-hmm. that like just walked in, walked over to the coat section, was flipping through, and boom, perfect condition, mm-hmm. absolutely gorgeous black tail coat. Yeah. Why do you think they're all wearing sunglasses? Because they have all the lights on. <laughs> Pretty sure it's obvious. <laughs> we jump back again into the criminologist's office, mm-hmm. and he's again speaking directly to us, giving us our directions. A little bit more energy this time. It's just a jump to the left, and we cut back. And then it's up to the right, and then cut back to Crim. You put your hands on your hips, and at this point, he's got the cigarette in his ha- mouth. Yeah, right? the cigarette holder is in his mouth and he's chomped down on it because he has started to participate in the dance at this point. <laughs> like, he secretly loves it. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is where you can see Brad in the background. Just tapping along. <laughs> and Krim says, with your hands on your hips, we cut back to the Transylvanians. And bring your knees in tight. But it's the pelvic thrust. And I think this is where we get a more full view of the banquet table Mm -hmm. and all of the other concoctions that the Transylvanians have brought, like a deep fried whole bird. (laughs) It's got its talons up in the air. (laughs) It's so ridiculous. And then we also see a pineapple. Just yeah. a pineapple. A whole pineapple with the French flag stuck into it because, you know, the classic French food, pineapple. And then if you look at this frame, Columbia's hat is already on the floor. So continuity error. They, I don't know who wasn't. They're, I, well, okay, with that many things on the set. No, one, you're not going to notice. How would you, yes. And like, oh my gosh, to remember that like, Oh, garden gnomes go on the mantle and at the base of the palm trees. And then there has to be a flag on a loaf of bread. Like, how is anyone going to keep any of that straight? See, I think that that was kind of Brian Thompson's, like, intention with the set design was just put so much shit in it Mm -hmm. that if something's out of place, nobody's going to notice because there's so much happening that you're not even focused on the hat that's on the floor because there's palm trees and Christmas lights and gnomes and food. And so many people. Yeah. And they're all different heights. And now we're seeing the variety to them, really. Yeah. Like, we're getting shots in this section of Time Warp that are directly comparing the Transylvanians to each other. Well, because there's wide shots, there's close shots, there's low shots, like, Mm -hmm. coming from the ground up to them, so it makes them... The canted angles? Yeah. Yeah. I think that those canted angles make them seem... Or it's maybe a suggestion that they are ultimately evil. Like... The bum 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 angle. Yeah, right. And, like, observing them is fine... Should we become a groupie like Columbia yes. to this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> the guests sing that the pelvic thrust really drives you insane. Let's do the time warp again. Let's do the time warp again. At this point, Columbia jumps down off of her jukebox and it starts to tap dance. Um, she takes off her hat, and she is tippy-tapping. And Magenta is pissed. Yes. Like, she... If looks could kill. (laughs) She's, like, looking at Rift so sweetly for a moment, and then she's like, uh, she's not tap dancing again. (laughs) No. Okay, well, as a Columbia, what Mm -hmm. do you think, why do you think she tap dances right then, right there? Because she wants to fit in so badly she's like everybody else is showing off their dance moves i just want to show them mine Mm -hmm. and the reason her dance is so different is because again she doesn't have those same shared experiences with the rest of the group she's not from transylvania she didn't time warp to get here Mm -hmm. she's been here and this tap i love it because nell was cast for her tap ability right 
she was cast because she is a dancer. And it's so funny to me that in the movie, they use different tap dancing audio than the actual dance that she does in the film. Right. So it's not synchronized. <laughs> and it poses a very interesting ultimatum for the performer. Yeah. So in the shadow <laughs> casting, it's really cool because you can either decide to do the dance that she does in the film, which is what I do. Mm -hmm. I've seen plenty of Columbia's who are actual tap dancers, and the reason they started shadow casting is because they're like, that's me, I do that thing. And they fell in love, so they learned from the audio how to recreate that dance. Okay, but that is really magical. It is. It's so wonderful. When you're sitting there, you hear the tap effects happening on the stage that you're watching. Mm -hmm. But that is interesting, because you get upshots of Columbia that don't show her feet at all. So, like, why does it even matter that she's tap dancing? Like, we only get snippets of it. Um, but I think you're right. I think it's more to illustrate that she's desperate to be a participant in this lifestyle, and she's going to show all her chops. Like, yeah. if she if she could play the trumpet, she would be pulling out a trumpet right now. Well, and, <laughs> and while she's doing this, the Transylvanians have given her the stage they're literally like bowing putting their arms out to her to like showcase her mm -hmm. they're giving her her moment to okay this is it this is your moment show us what you can do Kate, katie can you show me what you can do and do your best yow no my voice doesn't go that high sorry yeah! oh, <laughs> she's an angry cat she's like the cats you hear in the alley as much as i can paint <laughs> to look like now I, my voice will never sound like that ever <laughs> But the, you're right, the Transylvanians are like, okay, yeah, go ahead, start tap dancing. And they let her do it mm -hmm. until she literally trips on the carpet because she gets so into her spins. Mm -hmm. And then she trips on the carpet and falls and her hat falls off. Poor thing. And then the Transylvanians are like, cool, she's done. Let's do the time warp again, right? And Magenta walks over to her and again is like, what the fuck was that, dude? <laughs> this wasn't your moment. We've been planning our mutiny and it's not my fault you don't understand our English. And Columbia puts her top hat on, mad as hell, rises from the stairs. Then we jump back Again, to the criminologist, right. who is standing on his <laughs> desk. He is so involved in this that he has now gotten onto his desk, has his cigarette holder clamped in his jaw, uh -huh. and is dancing on top of his desk, which poses the question, is Krim from Transylvania? Is okay. he a Transylvanian? So, what we were talking about with lighting, right? And mm -hmm. the Transylvanians having to wear sunglasses, because mm -hmm. it's so bright. In Krim's office, in this frame we can see, he has two desk lamps on. Mm -hmm. One of them is a pineapple desk lamp, yeah. which is funny. Well, um, and we've also seen pineapple somewhere else. Yes. They're right next to each other. Mm -hmm. They're not at a usable place on his desk. <laughs> They're, like, not at all where he's been hanging out. Yeah. And he has... We get a good shot of the globe again that is turned on. But now that he's standing on the desk, he's got like this, what looks to me like an overhead lamp on right above him, mm -hmm. which is turned off. But I believe that's because we're only getting half of the story with Krim. Like, he's intentionally shady. Yeah. We're not supposed to know, maybe, that he's from Transylvania. But, like, also the, like, room casing that you see in the background... Is very reminiscent of the entryway uh -huh. into the castle. Right. Isn't there, a, a, isn't there a taxidermied bird in there as well? Yes. Okay, so you look at his feet, and there's the taxidermy bird. So it's like... We've got the pineapple, we've got the taxidermied birds, we've got the similar-looking room... What if the reason that Krim got so involved is because he is a co-worker of Dr. Scott, who is observing aliens. Oh. He's in the same UFO investigatory 
squad and he got so involved because Dr. Scott told him this story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he had to investigate. Yep. It's all coming together. I still like thinking he's from Transylvania. <laughs> and that this is like, like he's got to pull down the instruction manual, but it's ultimately his favorite dance. Mm. Also, okay, Magenta stood on the table mm-hmm. to do part of the time warp. Maybe Transylvanians dance on tables all the time. And like... <laughs> Grim has jumped on this table because that's just what they do. And he's basically shouting at this point, and he goes, it's just a jump to the left! And then Janet realizes that this is probably the last verse, and she starts pushing Brad to go, (laughs) and he's like, what? What? Because remember, Brad is tapping his foot, and he's getting into it at this point. Mm -hmm. We cut back to Grim who's wildly waving his arms around with your hands on your hips. And we wipe back to the ballroom where we see three specific Transylvanians Mm -hmm. put their hands on their hips and uh, bring their knees in tight. Uh, The camera tracks with Brad and Janet as they very uncomfortably back their asses (laughs) up to the stairs. They are scooching. They're literally just, like, one footstep at a time. Gotta get out of here. Yeah, like, they don't want to call any more attention to themselves now that they're leaving. But, like, they've already interrupted the party. Yeah. That's how square they are. That they're like, oh, we really we really can't interrupt them. They're very busy right now. <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk about those Transylvanians we just saw. Yeah. So we're going to get a little bit into the next Five Transylvanians. Part two. Whoop, whoop, whoop. So we've already talked about a couple of the Transylvanians that we just saw, but uh, we did want to bring up some of the others that are really close in these shots. Mm -hmm. There's Gay Brown. Mm -hmm. She was 33 at the time of filming. Um, She's the Transylvanian with the orange hair and the green shirt. Uh, She was in the wedding scene with the big white bow in her hair. She's in the wedding photo in the top left corner. Okay, I remember... Is she wearing a wig? Yes. Because she's got, like, the brightest orange hair. And it's got pink in the front, too. Pink yeah. at, the, at the roots. Very Bowie. Yes. Very, very Bowie. Well, and she's got the metallic lipstick, too. It's very, very Bowie. What's fun is she was actually in A Clockwork Orange as the opera singer in The I Milk Bar. Ugh. She uh, also appeared in Shock Treatment. Mm-hmm. So just before filming, Gay... Annabelle Leventon, who is actually the next Transylvanian that I'll talk about, and Mm -hmm. their friend Diane Langdon, started a glam singing group called Rock Bottom. They uh, got really famous really quickly and actually had a Sunday night spot at Kings Road Theater where Rocky Horror Show was being performed. Uh, So they were at the right place at At the right right time. time. Yeah, so Rocky Horror was dark on Sundays, so... All the crew and cast and everybody would go and see who was performing there on Sunday, where they all met. So they became fast friends and Mm -hmm. were offered a role as Transylvanian in the film. Mm -hmm. Because they needed them. Yeah. It wasn't something that was initially conceptualized. Yeah, it wasn't in the show, but they were like, hey, we need an ensemble in the film. Come and do the thing. But not even just an ensemble. Like, specifically... Glam rockers. Yeah. Like, an ideal casting choice for Transylvanians, you know? Well, the funny part is, is they um, had their look totally ripped off. And literally, their look, their names, everything. So on British TV back in the day, um, right after they had become famous as Rock Bottom, there was this show made called Rock Follies, based on their band. They cast new women to be... Diane, Gay, and Annabelle, they actually used their names and imitated their, like, likenesses. likenesses. Like, they dressed like them, did their hair like them and everything, and didn't pay the original girls anything. And it basically killed the band. Yeah. Because they had a TV show that wasn't them. Now you have to worry about um, finding lawyers Mm -hmm. to copyright, like, your name and stuff, and... 
sue a television show. So they did actually like, sue the TV show. Good. And they won. Good. <laughs> good. Like, yeah. They uh, had years and years and years of legal battles, but they did end up winning the legal battle. So that's good news. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair to, to steal the property like that. Yeah. We were talking about Annabelle Leventon, who is also in Rock Bottom. Rock Bottom. And uh, she's the Transylvanian with the short blonde hair and has two party hats on, like horns, on either side of her head. In the wedding scene, she was the guest in the turquoise jacket and skirt, and she's on the left side of the church throwing rice at Ralph and Betty when they're exiting. And she was 32 at time of filming. So similarly, uh, she had attended school in London. She attended Oxford University and uh, got her first acting experience with the Oxford Dramatic Society. She appeared as Sheila in the London stage version of Hair, which there's her tie to everybody, our production team. <laughs> well, not only that, but she got nominated for Actress of the Year for Sheila. So, like, snaps for Annabelle, honestly. So she's a, but she, a very talented actress. Yes. And she's just one of our ensemble members, mm -hmm. you know? She released a book in 2017 detailing her side of the story and her history of Rock Bottom. She also was in Shock Treatment and still acts, has been in many TV, movies, shows, but one of our good friends, Shadowcast, as Annabelle, and he has the perfect wig for her. Oh my gosh, it's so good. <laughs> He is my favorite <laughs> Annabelle Transylvanian. And he carries with him a framed Danny DeVito. <laughs> and then we've got Rufus Collins. So Rufus Collins is one of probably the more memorable Transylvanians. He's one of the very few black cast members in mm -hmm. this movie. Um, which, you know, at the time, first watching it, I was like, oh yeah, of course they have like two the black token people. Yeah. Diversity but castings. Diving into Rufus Collins, it's way more than that. Mm -hmm. So Rufus was 39 at the time of filming. Um, he's actually one of the older Transylvanians in the film. Mm -hmm. He is an American actor. <gasps> <laughs> one of the three. <laughs> four, four. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. There was like, n there were no Americans in this film besides Meatloaf who came with the crew from the Roxy and then Barry, Barry and Susan. Susan. Mm -hmm. And so Rufus was an American. Uh, he, like I said, was the black Transylvanian wearing the black tux with the teal lapels and the teal shirt. Um, he appears in the wedding scene as the man who drives up the car that Betty and Ralph leave in. Um, but going into his history, he was a member of the theater troupe The Living Theater in the 1960s. Um, very famous theater troupe, like insanely famous, and he was a big part of it. Um, he studied acting at the Central School of Speech and Drama in London, so there, well, okay. there we go, there's the London tie-in. Yeah. Um, but he did choreograph the London stage production of Jesus Christ Superstar, which is how wow. he met Richard O'Brien, Jim Sharman, the whole crew, because they were all part of Jesus Christ Superstar as well. That's nuts. Yeah, so... I had no idea <laughs> that he was, like, a dancer. He's a, a very professional dancer. Yes, he is an incredible choreographer, and... Jim Sharman and Brian Thompson loved him so much that they asked him to direct the stage version of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And then he also directed a revival of Hair. It's not the one that everybody was in, mm -hmm. but he did also direct... Well, he worked so closely with the production team for years yeah. at this point that, yeah, he would be a logical person to hand off the responsibilities to. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, unfortunately, he did pass away in 1996. I did want to read part of his funeral program because it was really beautiful to me. In Amsterdam, he directed The Kingdom, a full-scale opera with a cast of 40 young amateurs of color. This opera, about the black independence movement in Haiti, was to become characteristic for his body of work. Time and again, his productions would deal with racism and its consequences. And I just absolutely loved 
that quote from his funeral because it's still true. Yeah, like I said it earlier, we sometimes make the mistake of identifying him as a token character. But he's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. The reason he's in this film is because Jim Sharman and Brian Thompson loved him so much that mm -hmm. they were like... Worked with him all the time. This is our guy. We have to have him in it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel bad for younger Katie not knowing this information until I recently looked it up because Rufus Collins is an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. He did so much in theater mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as a choreographer and as a director that... I should have known about him before. Well, it's also really nice that he's immortalized in a movie that will continue to be shown for another 45 years. Mm -hmm. Like we're on the we're in the week of the anniversary right now. We will always have his likeness. Yep. And people will always be attempting to shadow cast his likeness. Heck yeah. Another Transylvanian we wanted to profile was Sadie Corey. She is the four foot one inch Transylvanian in the yellow shirt with black hair and black sunglasses. Um, she was 56 at the time of filming and had a long career of being a dancer, a pantomime artist. Uh, she studied at the Italia Conti Stage School and had her first professional role in the opera Madame Butterfly. But she was 12 years old in that. So yes. like by this point, decades of experience under her belt. Uh, she was in, you know, the old school cabarets as a tap dancer herself. Mm -hmm. You need that level of professional in this movie specifically, like for these characters. It brings it to another level. Yeah, we wouldn't care at all if these were humdrum extras off the street. Mm -hmm. Like, these were actors at turning points in their career or at the peaks of their career. Yep. You know? And it provides such a rich environment. Yeah. Like, you're looking at the frame and everybody is doing something... Interesting. And interesting, <laughs> and you can read into any of their character choices as traits of this alien species of Transylvanians. Mm -hmm. So Sadie Corey uh, used her height to her advantage and earned many roles, such as in The Dark Crystal, Return to Oz, Legend, Willow, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and she has a Star Wars connection <laughs> as an Ewok in Return of the Jedi. That's so cool. I know. I... We've got two Transylvanians that were in Star Wars now. We've got Sadie and we've got Steven. Mm -hmm. Well, and the funniest part to me is we have the tallest and the shortest Transylvanian that went on to be in Star Wars. That's <laughs> true! <laughs> Sadie, too, has passed away. She suffered a stroke in 2007 and then uh, passed away in 2009 at the age of 91. The last Transylvanian we're going to profile uh, today is Tony Venn. He was 30 years old at the time of filming. Uh, he is the Transylvanian in the blue shirt with the gray Andy Warhol hair mm -hmm. uh, and the popped collar. And like yellow shades. Yes. Like tinted yellow. Yeah. yeah. He's very Andy Warhol. Very. Oh. And he was the son of avid ballroom dancing fans. Yes. So his parents used to make him and his siblings, he had five or six siblings. Mm -hmm. He would make them perform for guests that would come over to the family <laughs> home. Very Von Trapp. Very <laughs> getting Von Trapp family singer vibes. Um, but so that's where his passion for dance came from is because he had to learn all these dances and then he was enrolled into a ballet academy, uh, the Singapore Ballet Academy at the age of 14. And then upon graduation studied at London's Rambert School of Ballet. Uh, 
so that's again right place at the right time mm-hmm. he was cast for the film and after the movie he returned to Singapore and continued to choreograph and instruct dance and he was a very accomplished uh choreographer in Singapore during that time. Um, Unfortunately, he did pass away in 1995 at the age of 51. He got so much done in that short 51 years. From Singapore to London, Mm -hmm. back to Singapore. Mm -hmm. He is an emphatic Transylvanian. He is participating in the time warp like it's his favorite. I love Tony Venn's Transylvanian. I love watching him because he has the funniest interactions with other Transylvanians. Mm -hmm. But Brad and Janet take this opportunity to move away from the craziness that the time warp is evolving into. Like, it's getting a lot faster, they're all moving a lot more sporadically, it's getting really wild, and they do that step 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 together <laughs> up, the, up the stairs to the door <laughs> and we cut back to riff in columbia in the middle of the ballroom mm-hmm. singing let's do the time warp again we get a really great shot of riff's humpback <laughs> and his hanger that's sticking out of his shoulder like well okay what is that hanger what is why oh is it a continuity or has he put a hanger into his jacket to make everyone think that he's a hunchback? It would throw it ya off his tail. Like, maybe also Richard O'Brien forgot that they put a hump in his costume and he, he just wrote was... it! He wrote it into the <laughs> screenplay! <laughs> After the everyone in the ballroom has had their fill of the time warp, they fall to the floor like flies exhausted everyone's participated even the transylvanians who were voyeurs at the beginning of the number like everyone's in and the way it finishes it like it doesn't just feel like we are like thank god this song is over it also feels like they're like, thank God the song is over, and we don't have to keep exerting so much energy to do this dance. They collapse on the floor so enthusiastically that there's literally one of the, one of the Transylvanians hits the table. You can see the table <laughs> kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> Brad and Janet, too, are now in silence. Janet is thinking, great, the song is over, now we can ask where the phone is. So she elbows him, says, say something. Say! Three guests pop up, startled from their post-orgy nap. Do any of you guys know how to Madison? (sighs) Janet rolls her eyes. Bradley? For everyone in the room. Majors. Ugh. Like it's he, so embarrassing. He was so involved with that dance that he was like, I know how to Madison. I want to join in. Maybe they know how to Madison. Because remember, he was like tapping his foot and snapping his fingers. Like he wanted to he wanted to dance with them. But he wants it to be on his terms. Like he wasn't going to learn the steps to the time warp. He's expecting them to know a dance that he knows. Right. It's also not what Janet wanted him to ask. <laughs> which is like why is Brad wanting to hang out and party still? You know, Mm -hmm. like if the real reason were to call someone to let them know we're stuck in the middle of nowhere, can you give us a ride or can you give us a a tire? You don't then encourage the party to continue. Like what's really happening? He asks this. No one laughs. Everyone's like, They start to kind of, like, mutter to each other. Janet straight up rolls her eyes at him. Uh Uh-huh. And she starts pulling him backwards, and he's, like, stumbling on his feet because he... Doesn't want to go. He does not want to go. And she's like, Brad, let's just, you know, let's just get out of here right now. For God's sake, keep a grip on yourself, Janet. Really? I would 
be so hurt. Like, get a grip on yourself. I would have left. I would have went back to the car. Yeah. And I would have been like, bitch, you get to call this person, this tow truck. I'm standing outside. I got it. I'm leaving. She says, it seems so unhealthy here. It's just a, a party, Janet. No, it's not. <laughs> this is not a normal party. <laughs> it is not a normal party. And she is not being that dramatic. She's not being... She's being totally reasonable. Reasonable. She's saying we've seen enough. We should go. We can find something else. We can wait in the car until it stops raining. Like, Janet's like, come on, there are other options. Let's just go. Because at their perspective, the Transylvanians have started to rise from where they've collapsed. And they have they these... They have these, like, crazy grins oh on gosh. their face. Like... Maniacal. Yes. They are, like laughing and it's because also we know what's about to happen and we see the elevator behind brad and janet start to descend Mm -hmm. and that's what the transylvanians are smiling about because they know what's about to happen but janet says well i want to go so one of my favorite movies of last year was midsommar there's so many moments where danny is telling christian I'm not comfortable anymore. I want to go. And you're my boyfriend. You're my, in this case, you're my fiance, Brad. Like, have my back. You should be listening to me and trying to protect me. Yeah. And he's so gaslighting her because every instinct he's trying to like deflect. He, because Brad is so distracted by his own desire to explore his own sexuality. Well, and it's the same with Christian. He's like, but I want to hang out with this weird cult. I'm doing this for anthropological reasons. I'm writing a research paper Yeah, I'm studying these people. It's okay if it's in the sake of research and if it's in the sake of observation. And it's like, okay, but to what point do you do that? Like, Janet's thinking, okay, we've gotten enough observational research because she's paying attention. Mm -hmm. She sees the taxidermy birds all over the place. She sees the items on the mantle that don't belong there. She's having trouble literally understanding the people around her. And what they're saying. Right. So she's like trying to remove herself from a dangerous situation Mm -hmm. and they have enough material that if they were to go to Dr. Scott and be like, wow, what a crazy detour we accidentally took. Like, we happened upon all these people. And then let Dr. Scott, who's the actual scientist and the actual researcher... Handle it. Yeah, handle what his job is, which is, like, a department (laughs) chair of of unidentified flying objects. Like, let him know of that thing. But... Don't ignore your girlfriend telling you... We gotta go. We gotta go. So she says, I wanna go. And... Well, we can't go anywhere until I get to a phone. Well, then ask the butler. Just a moment, Janet. We don't want to interfere with their celebration. This isn't the Junior Chamber of Commerce, Brad. They're probably foreigners with ways different from our own. They may do some more folk dancing. If the real thing, Brad, is that you need to get to the phone, like, okay, we can call Dr. Scott and still wait here until whoever's going to show up to help us out picks us up. But now they're waiting for more folk dancing? Yeah, like, that wasn't the point of coming into the castle, Brad. The point was to send out a beacon. Well, and Janet gets fed up at this point. She tells Brad, Look, I'm cold. I'm wet, and I'm just plain scared. Brad says, I'm here. There's nothing to worry about. And as he's saying that, he's not even paying attention. He's still paying attention to the activity in the ballroom. Janet has turned to see what all the Transylvanians have been staring at, 
and she starts like gapping her her mouth like a fish out of water she's like, like she's yeah, struggling she's like to breathe gasping for breath almost yeah it's very wendy in the shining okay like when wendy yes. gets scared i want i don't know if i would be so bold to call it like a Kubrick scare shot. But that's like, almost what it is. That's what it yeah. feels like. It's very reminiscent of that. We're getting the information before we see Frank that we are supposed to be terrified of Frank. Mm-hmm. Janet is not excited to see him. No. She has her most authentic faint, which makes me think that the other two that we saw earlier... Because this one, she like falls to the floor. like uh-huh. She is out. We get this beautiful shot of the back of Frank's head, and he spins around. In a most grand reveal. And we get this face. It's a zo- it's a, a sharp, fast zoom, right on Frank's face, right as Janet is screaming bloody murder, and we finally see the master of this house that Riff Raff has been referring to as, like, a trope goes, the master of the house is usually this reclusive dude in the middle of nowhere with a giant mansion, and he probably has a secret laboratory. So, spoiler alerts, <laughs> like, we're getting it set up for us that he is a mad scientist. Well, and fun fact, that Zoom shot... Mm-hmm. It was originally planned that this was going to be the Wizard of Oz moment, Mm -hmm. where all of a sudden the world goes from black and white to color. If we were doing a Wizard of Oz moment where we've been in black and white this whole time, we would just get that pop of the lips again, like Mm -hmm. from the beginning of the movie, giving us another deliberate message that we are supposed to be paying attention to, because if we can glean anything from Riff and Magenta, it's that Transylvanians lay their plans out and (laughs) tell people about them. So, like, we need to be reading Frankenfurter's lips. If they had stayed with that monochrome transition into, you know, the wonderful world of color, that would mean an even more direct commentary on how, like, people who suppress their sexualities lack color in their lives and once they have that one experience yeah and all the color comes into the world similar to frank like it can just be that lipstick before we get the full reveal of frankenfurter we've been getting the lead up anticipation to this another song number that's about to happen um with those intercut shots of his high heel, that diamond-studded high heel. So, you think, like, oh, the master of the house is a woman, because she's wearing heels. And interestingly, in the screenplay, Frank is referred to as a she, like a drag queen. Throughout, yeah. Yeah. I don't think we even put those two images together. Like, we see the heels, and we're like, oh, why are we getting this heel stomping? But he's starting his number. He's, like... Counting it in. Uh Uh-huh. So now is when we get to sweet transvestite. Or as we all lovingly call it, sweet tea. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So in this number... How sweet that tea is. Mm. So in this number, again, song, lyrics, music, done by the Richards. It's in the key of E major. And it was originally the fourth song in the musical before Time Warp. Um, But stylistically, it makes more sense for Frank to interrupt the party and move the action into the lab instead of it being introduced to the master right away. And now we're all partying together. Like, I like that we build the anticipation of not knowing who really lives here. Mm -hmm. He's openly boasting about who he is, what he's doing, what he's interested in, where he's from, how he's been doing it. Brad and Janet and all of us as audience members are just like, 
a ding 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 ding. So at this point, where we're getting to in the shadow cast, um, we have Brad and Janet, who has now backed up back onto the stage right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because again, that entrance that we've used for many things now is... For like riff. Yes. Uh -huh. So that entrance is now being used as our lift, our elevator. Mm -hmm. Our Frank reveal. And if you don't have a curtain or like a side a screen set up, uh, your Frank can just have his back turned yep. to the audience. I've definitely seen it done that way and it's the reveal's so, good. so good. It is so good. And I love to, if Franks pre-coordinate with their spots so that they know where they're going. Uh, I love a Frank that starts in the back of the theater, that Brad and Janet, as they're backing toward the lift, that you're actually ro walking backwards down the aisle, and then you run into Frank, and then Frank also has somewhere to go, and mm -hmm. can walk to the stage and have that reveal that we are salivating and waiting oh, for. Um, so yeah, you can get creative with the staging. Frank is what everyone has been waiting for, so it doesn't matter where he comes from as long as he's there. Mm -hmm. So he's looking down at Janet, and he says, How do you do? I see you met my faithful handyman. And then he turns to Brad and says, He's just a little brought down because when you knocked, he thought you were the candy man. And Frankenfurter is such a sarcastic bitch. I <laughs> love, I love, for real, because he, I, he's addressing Janet on the floor. He's not helping her up. And she's unconscious. Yeah. And he calls Riff a faithful handyman, which, if we can judge based on Magenta's outburst later, they've been asking to go to back home for a long time, maybe. Yes. And I think Frank is sarcastically saying that, like, Riff could be a better psychic. He could help me more, okay? And the only reason that he opened the front door for you guys is because he's so stoned out of his mind all the time. He thought you were bringing more drugs. Yeah, he had. He didn't really want to help you. Like, what a sassy queen, okay? <laughs> and Brad is dwarfed by Frank because Frank's got those heels on, you know? And Brad is looking up at him and is, like, shaking and shivering and stupefied and in awe. Like, cannot believe his eyes. Frank does this power walk out. He does this face that I can't describe. You just have to... It's so brief. It's like... His attitude throughout the movie is something that speaks to my soul. Yes. His facial expressions throughout the film are just so good. So good. But he walks into the camera. The camera does a transition through his cloak. And now we are watching him walk down the red carpet that's been rolled out for him. And all of the Transylvanians have formed themselves into two lines to greet him. He walks pa down past all of his guests. He says, don't get strung out by the way I look. Don't judge a book by its cover. We can't make any kind of judgments about him right now because he is fully cloaked and he's giving us a warning of, you think you've seen some extreme stuff so far? Like you haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, I'm giving you guys about a 15 second warning that like your mind is going to be expanded if you weren't thinking that men could wear lingerie <laughs> right now. Brad and Janet storm their way back into the ballroom mm -hmm. because now it's too late. Now Janet is intrigued and she comes back in. Brad is at her arm 
and Frank turns to face the camera, says, I'm not much of a man by the light of day, but by night I'm one hell of a lover. Okay, everyone picture it right now. Just, <laughs> I'm just a sweet transvestite <laughs> from transsexual Transylvania. <laughs> and that wow, 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 that saxophone in the background got us thinking, what if Eddie was delivering something or got a flat tire or whatever mm-hmm. 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 happened upon the castle had his saxophone on was carrying it with him because you know he's he's a sax man he's got to do his sax thing he never knows when he's going to get you know invited to do a sweet lick <laughs> on... and frank sees it and goes i need a sax for my band mhm maybe that's what seduced eddie into staying maybe He's again warning Brad and Janet that regardless of what I'm about to show you, like, you may not think I'm very masculine. You may not think I'm feminine enough. Regardless, I can screw your brains out. So, like, does it matter what I look like? Does it matter what anybody looks like? But he's also laying out what he's going to do. Yep. He's warning them that he is going to screw their brains out later. Frank's sweet tea corset. Oh, it's so cute. I love it. It's a, it's a lace-up corset in the front. But it's not like he's wearing it backwards, no. is he? No, because no. there's... it's. It was constructed for him. Uh-huh. It was constructed like that. Because the way that we do it in shadow casting is usually the easiest way is to get an underbust corset, flip it around backwards, and wear it like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've also seen it made mm-hmm. where it has a zipper in the back and it laces up the front. Which is helpful for quick changes. Heck yes. But he keeps this on... A majority of the show. Yeah, and the like green apron will go over it. Mm-hmm. and You could the... even put the dinner scene shirt over the top of it if you really wanted to. That's true. Yes. You could it, keep it on for a majority of the of the movie. Yeah. And everyone loves it because it shows all of his chest hair. And it's so iconic. It's Oh my gosh. That, he loves briefs. Yes. He's wearing like the black briefs. He's got fishnets on mm-hmm. that thigh high fishnets have with holes the garter in belt. Them. They look very punk. He's got a tattoo of forty seven eleven mm-hmm. on his thigh and his boss tattoo on his arm. Iconic. So beautiful. And forty seven eleven is a cologne. It's very stinky cologne. <laughs> Not a why fan, sorry. His, why is his favorite cologne that cologne? It was like a very um flamboyant cologne. Ah. Uh, brand. Ah. Uh, he's got those heels on platform heels he's got a pearl necklace (laughs) and wink and a diamond anklet yes he does this groin hip rotation to really imply like we're sexual beings here for anyone who had no idea what was happening when they got drug along to a midnight showing when they get this reveal of frankenfurter like i understand why brad and janet have trouble leaving after this because it's impossible to get introduced to this character and not want to know more more right the person who we can thank for that is the icon and legend tim curry I have such a respect for the guy, such a reverence for him. He honestly stumbled into this, and boy, his opinion on the movie has evolved over time. I mean, I wouldn't say he stumbled into it, because his thing was always acting. He wanted to sing, he wanted to act, he wanted this. Did he want to go to school for it? Not necessarily, no. He did go to school for it. 
but we'll get into it in just a moment. Tim Curry was born in 1946 in Cheshire, England. Um, unfortunately, his father passed away when he was very young. He was 12 years old. They did travel kind of all over the world mm -hmm. in his early childhood. Um, and then they finally landed in South London, right? Yes. So he developed into this very talented treble singer, um, which is like a male soprano. He was super influenced by Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong. He absolutely loved kind of that jazzy, bluesy um, sound. Mm -hmm. So he kind of started to vibe with that, but then really, really loved the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. So he kind of had this bluesy rock and roll vibe that he loved, which I thought was really fun. He graduated from the University of Birmingham with degrees in both English and drama in 1968 and following that he was cast in Hair. So mm -hmm. there's his association with our production team. What I love about his time in school though is he was notorious for not going to class. He would just kind of mess around and like do whatever he wanted and then just show up for exams and pass his exams. And one of his professors wasn't going to let him take an exam because- <laughs> his professor was like, dude, you haven't been here all semester. They didn't know who he was. They didn't think he was actually in the class. They didn't want to let him take the exam. And he was like, no, I'm here. I know this stuff. Let me take the exam. And he passed and he got his degree. I mean, hey, C's, C's get degrees. Well, and that's kind of how he got the role in hair, too. He went in and he was like, no, I'm an actor. I'm a professional actor. I'm part of the actor's union. I can be in this show. Uh -huh. And just kind of lied about it. No, he straight up bold face lied about his experience yeah. to get cast in a show. And then when the production team realized that he had been fibbing about his resume, they were like, well, he's talented, so. Well, he's got the He's stuff really it good. takes so like i guess we're gonna keep him like we can't fire him he literally just lied good. his way into acting he was like yeah no i'm a professional i do this oh my gosh and he was not the original consideration for frankenfurt no it was another actor named jonathan kramer who had auditioned for frank they were basically set on him but then Tim ran into Richard O'Brien as Richard was leaving a gym, mm -hmm. and he was like, hey, bud, what you up to? Why are you leaving this gym? That's weird. You don't go to the gym. <laughs> and Richard's like, well, I'm looking for a muscular guy who can like a sing. Man. Like a Yeah, I want like a really buff dude, but who, who can sing like an angel. Because he was casting for Rocky Horror. Mm -hmm. He was casting literally Rocky. Right. And... Um, Tim was like, oh, okay, that's weird, like, this production you got going on, and, uh, Richard was like, yeah, come by, come to the audition, sure, whatever, came in, and apparently it was said that he walked in and said, let's tear it up. And Richard O'Brien's quoted as saying, I'm afraid poor old Jonathan never stood a chance against the guy. Because like, he really didn't. Tim no. had this energy and this just aura around him that, like, everybody fell in love with him. Born to play the role. Yes, Destined absolutely. To be Frank and And Richard O'Brien, I think, had him in mind already, probably. And it was just kismet that he got him to audition because Richard O'Brien recalls hair and says... Tim was the most beautiful thing on stage, which is such a lovely thing to say about a person, regardless of however he might feel about Tim Curry. It's also exactly what he was casting for. He wanted someone who was on captivating. Stage, yes, exactly. Someone who you. just captivated the audience. Fun fact. He sang Tutti Fruity as his audition song. <laughs> and like, it just he shows who was casting. He was like, oh, my friend Richard, who's into rockabilly music and wants to hear like male 
soprano voices. Yep. I'm going to do a, a little Richard song. <laughs> oh, and it, like... Brilliant. Looking at his influences from his, like, early childhood and stuff fits perfectly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because then he started making his own music. Mm-hmm. And he released three albums, Read My Lips, Fearless, and Simplicity. Yes. And everyone's favorite song. I Do The Rock. <laughs> it's such a fun song and music video. We're putting it on the blog. It's like my favorite music video. It's so it's funny. It's ridiculous. But it's like quintessential Tim. Yeah. Like. If you love Tim Curry, you've seen this music video and you know this song. Mm-hmm. He had so many different ideas for how Frank and Furter could be performed. Oh yeah. Frank went through so many different iterations. He first had... Blonde hair. Blonde hair, German accent. Okay. He played around with having, like, an American accent for a little while, but then apparently he was on the train one time and heard a woman with an English accent asking, do you have a house in the town or a house on the country? (laughs) That was a beautiful accent. Thank you for that one. It was great. It wasn't an English accent. Every time I try to do British, it just turns into Australian. I can't do a British accent. But Curry heard this woman Mm -hmm. on the train and was like, that's it. Uh That's the accent. Frank is going to sound like the queen. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. After he filmed the movie, he returned to the Rocky Horror Show, which was running on Broadway at the Belasco. And it was panned by the critics. Just horribly panned. Like, they Only hated it. Only lasted for 45 performances. They... And that, in combination... With, with the film bombing. Yeah, deciding it's not going to get distributed anymore. Like, what a bummer to work so hard on a character and fill out Frankenfurter to a T, literally. Yeah. It's sad that he wasn't immediately um, rewarded and thanked for the performance. Well, and his heart was broken. He said, I think that was really one of the most formative things that has ever happened to me. I just went home and took out a bottle of vodka for about a month, actually. I sent out for submarine sandwiches and drank and got hugely patched and then started work again. I think once you've had a really serious failure, nothing can ever be as bad as that again. So you might as well go for it because they can't make you feel any worse than they did before. And that's so heartbreaking. That quote is just so heartbreaking. Uh Like, that was the worst thing that ever happened to me, so I figured, why not just go do it again, because they can't ever make me feel worse than I did. And he, I think, was objectified and ostracized for this performance, Mm -hmm. and talk about judging a book by a cover. Like, people started to make so many assumptions about him as a person separate from Frankenfurter as a character. Yep. And he started to separate from the image that made him famous, you know? He didn't want to be recognized as Frankenfurter, so he put on weight, and he made a point of having such an illustrious career as an actor after the fact that it wouldn't be the immediate association mm-hmm. is Frankenfurter. So one of his one of his um, classmates from university was actually the writer of Amadeus, and he said, "I'm writing a role for you." And Tim said, "Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. It's gonna go to somebody else." But he was writing him the role of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and. That was kind of his, one of his most iconic roles is Mm -hmm. in Amadeus. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's nominated for a Tony. Yeah, he was incredible. And that's where a lot of actors know him from. Uh, Dame Judi Dench is quoted as saying, I was enamored with him because I knew him and I fell in love with him during Amadeus. But that's just him. That's just. I think once you come into contact with Tim Curry, you fall in love. Yes. You see him, and that's just the presence that he has mm-hmm. is just, oh. And so that 
kicked off his return to stage shows in London and New York. He did Pirates of Penzance, My Favorite Year, which he was nominated for another Tony, A Christmas Carol, Spamalot, uh, which he was again nominated for a Tony Award, and he's also been in an insane amount of movies that we can only list, you know, the ones that people are like, oh yeah, I know Tim Curry from blah blah blah, but there's like, you can't name every single thing that he's been in. Some highlights, um, Annie, he was uh, Rooster Hannigan. Mm -hmm. the, the swindler. Yes. Yes. And then he was in Legend and was cast as the Lord of Darkness, uh, and it was directed by Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott, which Ridley Scott cast Tim specifically after seeing Rocky Horror and seeing the levels he was capable of performing. And well, and not only that, but he was able to emote so much behind the makeup and behind the costume and everything. Like he could still play a character through all of that mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he was like well if he can act through that then I'm sure he could act through all of all of the whatever I'm putting on him in this and um, if you've seen Legend it's literally he's the devil he has this giant prosthetic suit on it's insane I love him in Clue I yes. think Wadsworth is one of my favorite characters that he's played <sighs> Yeah, it rivals Frankenfurter because he carries the whole movie. Mm -hmm. His energy is off the charts. Um, the last third of the movie is basically a running monologue. Like, literally, he's yes. running <laughs> through the castle. And Well, in Clue was where they found out, oh, he can be funny, too. Yes, because and he's, oh my gosh. He was kind of like a dramatic actor, like a musical actor before this. And then they were like, wait, he can do funny? Mm -hmm. And so that's where they got him to do Home Alone 2, where uh -huh. he was the snarky uh, concierge, concierge yeah. guy. And then um, he was Long John Silver in Muppet Treasure Island, which if you haven't watched Muppet Treasure Island, pause the podcast right now and go watch <laughs> Muppet Treasure Island. I'm not kidding. It is the best movie on the planet so good. I love Muppet Treasure Island. Oh my god. So good. Uh, he was also in Adam's Family Reunion as Gomez, cast alongside Daryl Hannah as Morticia. And, and that wasn't that wasn't like one of the big Adam's Family movies. It was a direct-to-video one, but it's still worth the watch. It's Daryl yeah. Hannah and freaking Tim Curry. Yeah, I love Daryl Hannah. Splash? <laughs> Iconic. One of my favorites. I keep forgetting It was a TV movie. Yeah, it was a time. miniseries. It wasn't even a TV movie, it was a mini-series, so there was like, I think like six episodes? I'd say if people don't know Tim Curry from Frankenfurter, it is as Pennywise from It. Yes. And like, not just that, people are terrified of Pennywise, mm -hmm. don't realize it's Tim Curry, and then it's like, holy cow, it's the same person? Oh my gosh, I, I can't... <laughs> He's my nightmares. He's what have turned me against clowns, you know? Like, people have that reaction to Pennywise. So another one that he is really known for, and that is hilarious, is The Worst Witch, which is a made-for-TV movie. Uh, he has this song in it called Anything Can Happen on Halloween, and we're going to put the video on the blog because... <laughs> whew, that's... <laughs> Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Everybody knows Tim Curry from something. From something. And he did that purposefully. Like, he wanted people to associate him as a character actor with a huge profile of abilities and skills and talents. He moved to L.A. in 1988 and purchased and restored a grand 1920s mansion and he's never been married has had a, a very quiet life outside of the spotlight yeah it seems his his personal life is is pretty well kept quiet which is really nice well it explains why when he had his stroke in 2012 media did not know about it until a almost, year, yeah, yeah almost an entire year, year later we mentioned it earlier that he hated talking about Rocky Horror, and 
when looking for quotes from him, like, it's almost infamous that he would redirect the conversation every time it gets brought up because he really didn't want people to remember him. It was, it was a heartbreaking for thing for him. It was really tough Painful. for him to talk about because it was this thing that he put his heart and soul into that people just hated. But it seems to have kind of turned around once it started to become a cult phenomenon. Like, people ended up really loving and identifying with that character, which I think kind of opened him up a little bit more to talk about it. Because we did find quotes from him. So, in 1976, you know, right after the movie had come out, he's quoted as saying, I can't really relate to the film very well. I still feel sick when I see it. Then in 1978, uh, a couple years have gone by, he's like, the Rocky Horror Mania doesn't surprise me. It's a very good joke, a kind of rock and roll Oz, and it just took some time to find its audience. He says, I don't like those conventions. I get the feeling the audience is being exploited, and I don't want to be the party to that. Once it got to be the 10-year mark, that's when he started to feel like it was a rite of passage and that it was something that he did right. He says, I was very pissed off about it for a while. I had gone on, but I learned to let go. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not really a problem anymore. I'm very proud of it. It's very amazing to star in a movie that's run for 15 years. It's a classic of its kind. I live quite comfortably with him now, Frank. But there was a period where I couldn't stand him. At the height of the cult, people would follow me home, furtively pressing satanic literature into my hand. They'd go through my garbage. I'd be so concerned that Frankenfurter was how I was actually perceived. And that was in 92. So like, imagine working on something like 10 years ago and then like, you still have stalkers going through your garbage yep. and are convinced that you're the leader of, like, a new world order. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it makes, me, it makes me sad that that was his experience on it. Um, but in recent years, he's, he's really come to terms with it, and he's actually started going to conventions and meeting with fans and being a lot more receptive to the community. I think it's probably because we leave him the fuck alone. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. go through his garbage. <laughs> yeah, we respect him. And the time to tell him that you're a huge fan of his is at a con. Yes. Is, uh, is fan mail. Like, not, you know, going to his house. Yeah, and then in 2002, he was quoted, I'm terribly proud of it. I should have the luck to be the star of a movie that's run for 25 years and that people are still inspired by, that kids love, that give them alternative patterns of sexuality that make them feel good about themselves. I love all of that. But I really don't want to answer another question about the meaning of Frankenfurter for the rest of my life. I think I did it, and enough already. <laughs> you know, he's accepted that it's his... Legacy. Swan song, yeah. You know, and people will be talking about it forever. Not just talking about it, emulating his every move, every facial expression. Like, we have Franks that are so skilled at their performance that they grab all of the right beats, they do all of the crazy facial expressions that mm -hmm. he mugs to the camera. I I would love uh, for him to see some shadow casts again. Yeah. So for the remake, he asked Lou Adler and Kenny Ortega, who directed it, if he could be Dr. Scott. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Tim Curry is uh, wheelchair-bound wheelchair and does use a wheelchair now after his stroke. And Dr. Scott is wheelchair-bound and does use a wheelchair. Um, so he thought, hey man, why not? I can be Dr. Scott. This will be fun. But they had the vision of him being the narrator or criminologist. Um, so Tim Curry actually got to be in the remake and was the criminologist for the remakes. So I just thought it was so cute that he asked to be Dr. Scott because he was like, I'm in a wheelchair, he's in a wheelchair, why not? Yeah. 
because we just recently rewatched the remake. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not as bad as we thought it was. Well, we just need to record an episode for our Patreon that's going over the remake. Because, yeah. oh, thoughts. So there, thoughts. Yeah, there, there are some cringy moments, but really, overall, it's it's not as bad no, as yeah. we thought it was. Much more of an homage and leaning into, like, the jokes that we should be catching. Mm-hmm. One last thing I wanted to mention that I love so much about Tim Curry is his love of gardening. His garden at the Los Feliz Mansion has won awards and stuff because of how beautiful and incredible it is. And we will have pictures of his garden up on the blog. I have them saved already because it really oh, yeah. is absolutely gorgeous. Just so that's the, the last thing I wanted to mention was he loves gardening. <laughs> Well, thankfully, we're going to get a ton more of him. Like, we're just getting introduced to Frank Inverter, so um, get comfortable with him. Brad and Janet are not so comfortable right off the, off the bat. <laughs> um, jumping back into the movie, when we cut back to F- Brad and Janet, he does like a, hmm, I don't know if I like this anymore. And Janet just is in awe. She mm-hmm. doesn't know exactly where to look, but she's not as frightened as she was during Time Warp. Frank then walks down the steps from by his throne between the two lines of Transylvanians. The camera tracks back. He walks all the way back how he just came to, like, force Brad and Janet to, like, come into the party. <laughs> like, okay, guys, like, you're here. Can't you count? Can't you guys act like normal guests and stop standing by the door, please? So he walks all the way back to them, tells them, let me show you around. Baby, play you a sound. You both look like you're pretty. And he makes the face that shows us what he really thinks. (laughs) Which is like, yeah, oh wow, they're square. He's making the facial expression to us as the the camera, yes, to give us the indication that we're in on the joke yeah and he's in on the joke he knows how absurd it is for brad and janet to be in his house right now and like well we're gonna try let's see how this goes let's see if they're groovy because i've told them not to judge me by my appearances so i'm not gonna judge them you could be a good time so he breaks them apart starts pushing them backwards toward the throne and tells them, or if you want something visual that's not too abysmal, we could take in an old Steve Reeves movie, which is Frankenfurter's clearly favorite movie actor. (laughs) So if you don't know who Steve Reeves is, he's an American bodybuilder who was an actor in Italian films. Um, They did these movies called sword and sandal movies and they were these historical or biblical epics uh mostly set in like greco-roman or medieval periods Mm -hmm. spartacus samson and delilah ten commandments type of thing um he played all of the giant muscular men greek gods greek gods or heroes he was like in hercules and stuff like that so Mm -hmm. He's this big, muscular dude, almost like Arnold Schwarzenegger looking. Okay. Like, very big, very muscular. Uh Obviously some inspiration for what Frank is planning a little bit later. What he thinks might be the perfect man. Yes. And I love that he suggests it to Brad and Janet. Like, even squares watch movies. Frank has pushed Brad and Janet back into the ballroom and turns to go get something to drink, which... From an earlier frame, we can see that the water cooler is filled with a mysterious red Red? liquid. Like, is it blood? Is it wine? Is it... Fruit punch? Who knows? Is it spiked sangria? Maybe. Um, (laughs) But he pours himself a paper cup, and he's like, now that Brad and Janet are in the party... He's thinking, like, they'll they'll talk to people. Like, cool, I brought you in. Now stop being wallflowers and, like, get to know people. But 
Brad doesn't want to be there anymore because he sees he's that freaked Janet, out now yeah and she's interested she's intrigued she they have swapped roles at this point because brad saw frank and was like absolutely not get me out of here and janet was like wait a minute uh-huh hello sailor <laughs> so brad starts following frank and says i'm glad we caught you at home can we use your phone we're both in a bit of a hurry. But are you in a hurry, Brad? Because you've waited until... This long. No, and not even that. If he wants to let them continue folk dancing, let Frankenfurter finish his song. No. Like, no, I need my phone now. I he's need like, it now. He's uh, like, Janet can't be looking at this anymore. Uh, can we use your phone? <laughs> and he's so flustered, and it's like he's trying to remember why they're there yeah and so is janet that's why she's like right oh oh yeah we didn't come here for a party i totally forgot we'll just say where we are then go back to the car we don't want to be any worry and frankenfurter straightens up he understands that uh his booby trap worked Mm mm-hmm and uh, he's also, like, kind of straightened up at Brad being ultra-protective of Janet and, like, possessing her, like, putting his arm around her, staking his claim, and he shakes the hands of a couple Rufus different... Collins yeah. and another Transylvanian. Right as Brad says, we don't want to be any worry, Frank tosses the remaining drink Onto us, the audience, who are standing behind the two Transylvanians. He doesn't splash Brad and Janet with water. And when he spins around for his ultra close-up, where he breaks the fourth wall, if we had any doubts that he was breaking the fourth wall, he has broken the fourth wall because he splashed a cup of water on us and was like, guys, pay attention right now. Here it is. I'm about to give it to you. Well, you got caught with a flat. How about that? And then he turns to Brad and Janet. So we're supposed to know. We're in on this joke. We either Frank saw Brad and Janet at the Denton Episcopalian, thought they were the perfect next specimens, and figured out a way to give them a flat tire there, or uh, the dead end sign is booby trapped because no one mentioned anything about a flat tire to Frank. Well, yeah, and Brad nods and he's like, yeah, and Janet, I'm not gonna panic because I'm gonna, you're gonna let me use your phone. And Janet looks so confused. She's like, we never, we yeah. never told you we got a flat. Yeah, like, wait, he, he didn't know we didn't tell him that we had car trouble we told riffraff we had car trouble and frankenfurter turns to brad and janet wiggles his finger at them and says well babies don't you panic by the light of the night it'll all seem all right i'll get you a satanic mechanic now for the mechanic is he talking about himself no he's talking about no one (laughs) He's telling them, you guys are on a a ride straight to hell. (laughs) And like... Well, is he the mechanic? Is he gonna fix their undercarriage? Ooh. Yeah, but he is telling them, like, you guys think you're getting back to your car? No, no, no. You're not leaving. If he's saying, I'll get you a satanic mechanic, if he's talking about Eddie, is he foreshadowing that he's going to cannibalize someone like I'm gonna get you a satanic like I'm gonna get you a side of coffee like I'll get you a little satanic mechanic if you really want (laughs) wait I really like that idea you know where it's like yeah well guess what's on the dinner menu tonight okay (laughs) it's a mechanic someone who can really help you out with your car he dances his way over to the throne he picks up Columbia on the way and they boom chicka boom chicka their way up the stairs. He again says, I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. 
at this point, I think Frank is owning the term transvestite in the way it was used in 1975. Like, drag queens were called transvestites. It was a derogatory term that cross-dressers were assigned and people who were non-gender conforming were negatively called. And I think this is Frank owning that name. Frank sits on his throne, swings his legs over the arm, and is he becomes framed by Riff on his left, Magenta behind him, and Columbia by his feet. Just like salivating over his shins. <laughs> and uh, why do they pose that way? Like what is the purpose of seeing them together. I don't know why Riff and Magenta go up on the stage and, or why anybody goes up on the stage. Is the idea that Frank has so many groupies that they just flock around him wherever he goes? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it's that Frank is the rock star and this is his posse. Frank then suggests to Brad and Janet, why don't you stay for the night? Night. Or maybe, a bite. Bite. I could show you my favorite obsession. He's suggesting you guys could stay for the hookup, you could stay for the meal afterward, or hey, I got an idea. Frank is conveniently hijacking the plans of the convention and realizes, oh, I. I could show everybody what I've been working on, you know? If he's obsessed with the idea of making a perfect man, and it takes half of a brain to make one every mm -hmm. time that he's trying to create this life. Like, yeah, Eddie and Columbia, but who were the people before Eddie and Columbia, you know? Are all of those medusa statues his previous creations. Maybe, because he's obsessed with doing this. This mm -hmm. is like his life's work. But Magenta's in on the joke too, because she raises her eyebrows very suggestively, like, wah, it's wah. exactly what you think his obsession is. Frank leans backwards and starts playing with Riff Raff's stringy, greasy hair. And he says, I've been making a man with blonde hair, and a tan, and he's good for relieving my <laughs> tension. Riff Raff looks a little disappointed at the mention of Rocky. Mm -hmm. uh, Riff wants to be important. Riff wants to be noticed. Riff wants to... Does he want to be Frank's plaything? I don't know if he wants to be Frank's plaything as much as he wants to be Frank. The camera pans down Frank's body Columbia drinks him in as we see his, that the fishnets in the, their entirety. He slowly and seductively stands from his throne and he's saying, again, I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. But now he's like, I've told you guys everything I need to tell you. I've told you my hidden plan. You're so distracted by what I'm wearing that you can't even understand that what would be good for you is to not follow me up to the lab. Mm -hmm. Like, I caused your flat tire. You people should be running for the hills. Well, and now the song, like, picks up pace almost. It picks up that energy. It's like mm -hmm. a train leaving the station picking up steam, mm -hmm. which is funny because that's kind of the motion that he gets because he is, hey, hey, I'm just a sweet transvestite and everybody everyone everywhere is singing along transvestite from transsexual transylvania columbia and magenta are singing along magenta's cradling columbia's leg and riff wants to be in that throne so bad he wants to be in the captain's chair so he's like he looks like a little kid like on the arm of the chair, 
pouting and kicking his legs because <laughs> he wishes he could participate in the chorus line. Frank again physically breaks Brad and Janet apart as he storms back down the ballroom. He gets back into the lift. He turns around to address Brad and Janet again. And I love the increasing close up. Oh, I know. Every. Every chord. Every cut. Mm -hmm. Every chord, every cut, it gets closer and closer and closer. And you don't really realize it. Mm -mm. It's so Mm -mm. subtle. So, come up to the lab. Burn. And see what's on the slab. And every time we move away from Frank, we're getting Brad and Janik's reactions to each other. Um, Not knowing if the other really wants to stay there anymore like they kind of look at each other with like questioning eyes Mm -hmm. frank says i see you shiver with antici and janet leans forward patient oh yeah that's that's the word he was saying i forgot words were a thing for a second that's what janet's saying but maybe the rain isn't really to blame. And Brad suddenly realizes, oh yeah, my hair is still wet. But the rain isn't really to blame. So I'll remove the cause. (laughs) (laughs) But not the symptom. (laughs) And uh, I love that line because Frank is calling Brad out like, You had your opportunity to ask for the phone. You didn't. You were asking for a party, and now I'm going to give it to you because you guys had plenty of opportunities to turn around and go. And also, like, you guys are clearly turned on by me, and you're clearly aroused by what you're seeing. So, okay, Bradley J., you can tell me that you're shivering because you're drenched to the bone, when that's not the reality. He had a scotch guarded seasonal jacket on. <laughs> like, the rain is not the reason why Brad is now having these feelings of confusion and interest and arousal. Mm-hmm. So Frank's like, sure, I'll let you guys stay in the house while it's raining outside, but I can't guarantee you that the shivers are going to stop. With that, he has set, he presses that elevator button. That is the final chord to the song, and that elevator seals him up into the creation room, and it also seals up our segment. Yep, that's the end. That's the end. That's all we got for you. So be sure to follow us on our social medias. Our Instagram is at Time Warp Radio. Our Facebook is Time Warp Radio Podcast. Our blog spot is timewarpradio.blogspot.com. You can send us an email at timewarpradiopod at gmail.com. And we can't wait to discuss our next segment where we'll finally get into the creation scene. We'll be profiling Little everyone's Nell. favorite groupie. Yeah, Columbia and Lil Nell. So remember, on Wednesdays, we, we watch, watch Rocky. Rocky. Bye. (laughs) Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps us out, and we appreciate all your feedback. We'll see you next time.